Well, all right, this is the last panel. Uh, drinks are not far away. I hope, uh, I hope Ned Phelps has saved the, uh, the, the, the best for last. Um, there's not an economist on this panel. Uh, you, you, the, the, uh, the, the subtitle of the forum is Social Values and Individual Experience. And uh, that's um, the, the title of this panel is How Evolving Values, it says suppress, but I'll say affect uh, individual initiative. And uh, it's, uh, I think, a truism that a healthy economy um, to, to some great extent is a function of what we value. If we value big stone heads, we'll create an economy that not, does nothing but build big stone heads or flat screen TVs, we'll have a flat screen TV in every, every, um, every bedroom. And it's, uh, the, the values work on many levels. And one of the values is our values of, of individual initiative. Uh, Professor Phelps and others have demonstrated persuasively that economy, especially our economy, is to a great extent a function of, of, of individual initiative. And so this panel is going to pick up on Peter Thiel's lunch talk and begin to say, well, what's, what has happened in our society to our values? that might affect the capacity for and the energy of, of individuals to build uh, a flourishing society. Um, you know, one of the aspects of individual initiative is, is trial and error, the, you know, our capacity for it and our acceptance of it, uh, risk taking is part of that. And we're going to go explore several different facets of this. We're going to try to keep our discussion somewhat shorter and then have a back and forth both among the panelists and with the audience about, about where we are and, and where we should go uh, with discussing and creating a public narrative about the role of the individual in our society and in our economy. Thank you. First up, we have a great panel. Jonathan Haidt, psychologist from NYU, uh, given wonderful TED Talks, uh, is uh, an important thinker about how values are changing in our society and, and also the reflection of values in human nature. Barry Schwartz, also a professor of psychology. Uh, at, at, at Swarthmore, been writing around these issues for, for several decades. Um, I'm going to speak third, and batting cleanup is, it, is Lewis Lapham. Um, I, and I think Lewis too, have no idea what he's going to say. Um, <laughs> he's uh, uh, obviously a very distinguished editor, author, longtime editor-in-chief of Harper's Magazine, now um, runs Har uh, Lapham's Quarterly, which if you don't subscribe, I encourage you to. It's absolutely fascinating compendium comes out quarterly on, on specific topics um, of different writings through the ages. So Lewis will be very thoughtful on these issues as well. So first up, Jonathan Haidt. Okay, well thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about 10 social trends that uh, might help explain something that's happening that seems to be undermining individual initiative. These are trends that have been going on for a while uh, and that are relevant to things happening today. And by today, I mean today, November 9th, uh, as you will see as we go, as we go on. Uh, now these are trends, some of which can be uh, proven to be related to other trends that I'll talk about. Uh, in other cases, the links are more speculative, and I just want to put them out there as a presentation of plausibility a story of, that might explain some very strange things that are happening in American society in particular. So here's the first trend. <clears throat> Capitalism makes countries richer. I think this is uncontroversial, particularly in this group, that uh, not much happens in economic development until countries open themselves to markets and trade, and then wealth and value begin to rise very, very rapidly. Um, second trend, as they do that, violence generally goes down, as Steven Pinker showed. Uh, it's the combination of, of, of trade, uh, extensive trade networks, and the wealth itself that it generates. Uh, leads to an enormous drop in violence. That's a logarithmic scale. So violence drops by about 99% compared to pre-state societies. 
And as this all happens, as countries get richer and safer, people get happier. This is a, a map showing Gallup data about happiness in the world. Uh, and the World Bank, the economists who, who did this, uh, the, the uh, United Nations um, um, uh, concluded that the largest single factor in predicting happiness is actually GDP per capita, although there are many others. Uh, the fourth trend. As these changes happen, as uh, countries get safer and happier, we get changing values. And this has uh, been shown in the World Values Survey that's al already been referred to today. Uh, they've been surveying countries since 1981. And what they find when they arrange the countries, they do multidimensional scaling, put countries near each other that have similar values. They, uh, the countries array like, like this. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, and what you see is you see the Islamic and uh, Sub-Saharan African countries in the bottom left, the Scandinavian countries in the upper right, uh, the Anglosphere countries on the right edge, the, um, and the Confucian countries in the upper left. Now, the way to think about this is as follows. There is a general trend by which countries move as they get richer. And you might think that they're going uh, from the bottom left to the upper right. But that's not actually what they find. The actual pattern is like this. As countries industrialize, they make a transition from agriculture, which has certain kinds of values typically, um, to, um, to post in, to, uh, uh, industrial uh, societies with materialist values. People value money a great deal. And I think this is what gives capitalism a bad name all around the world. The early phases of it make people forget about religion and go crazy for money. It looks rather ugly. But if you just wait a couple of generations, what you generally get is a transition um, to a, uh, a service economy. And now the skills that are needed and the values that, that are adaptive are those that help you deal with people, more creative, more empathic. Um, the overall trend is described by one of the authors of the study, Christian Welzel, as follows. As existential, uh, as existential threats decline, he says, fading existential pressures open people's minds, making them prioritize freedom over security, autonomy over authority, diversity over uniformity, and creativity over discipline. Another way to say this is that values shift to the left politically. People become more progressive. They care more about women's rights, animal rights, the environment, gay rights, sustainability. So this uh, certainly looks great for progressive causes, and it looks great for innovation, creativity, instead of, uh, instead of discipline. So this all looks good for the topic we care so much about here, namely innovation. But as these social values change in this direction, the nature of childhood changes, and the way that we raise our children cha changes. Um, in the words of Jennifer Senior, the journalist Jennifer Senior, she says, children become economically worthless, but emotionally priceless. And as this happens, we certainly we stop spanking our children. I think that's all to the good. But as we care more and more for the, our precious one or two children, uh, we, we begin to do what we call in this country helicopter parenting. Recently, I've heard the term snowplow parenting. The parents should clear away all obstacles for the child. We get the decline of free range uh, parenting. Um, as Lenore Skenazy has described. And we get, the, we get instead, we get it replaced with very fearful and protective parenting. Uh, in fact, this was just in the news today. Some parents were on vacation in Cape Cod. They let their kids stay on the beach for an hour. Ages seven and nine, they were arrested. The parents were arrested. In this country, it is now often illegal. You can be arrested if you let your kids play outside. On your property is okay, but if they walk a block to a park, you can be arrested. It's so dangerous. What if, what if, what if they're abducted? The result is that children grow up to be fragile adults. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger, said Nietzsche. Um, Mencius, Meng Tzu, put it even more explicitly. He said, when heaven is about to confer a great responsibility on any man, it will exercise his mind with suffering, subject his sinews and bones to hard work, and place obstacles in the paths of his deeds so as to stimulate his mind, harden his nature, and improve wherever he is incompetent. Now, that makes a lot of psychological sense. And that sense is explained in Nassim Taleb's most recent book, Anti-Fragile. A carton of eggs is fragile. Don't bang it around or the <coughs> eggs will break. 
Uh, but uh, anti-fragile systems are those that increase in capability, resilience, or robustness as a result of mistakes, faults, attacks, and failures. What are some examples of these? Well, um, Taleb talks about bone. If you don't stress your bones, they get weak, and that's one of the difficulties of taking astronauts to Mars. Um, the immune system. Um, if you don't, if you protect your kids from dirt and germs, their immune system won't have a chance to develop. And finally, he talks about children. Children are anti-fragile. They need challenges and failures. They need to play outside, get scared, and come running home. They need all those things. Um, if they don't, they grow up to be fragile, and that's trend number six. So I recently wrote an article in The Atlantic with, uh, with my friend Greg Lukianoff about how we're seeing the results of this on college campuses where levels of anxiety are rising, fragility uh, is rising, um, and it's causing enormous problems for pedagogy. It's causing enormous problems for teaching. Okay, so that's the first set of trends, this first six trends, which I believe are not unique to the United States. I've seen evidence of them in Asian countries. Um, uh, we get, wherever you get the demographic transition, you'll get this sort of trend, although it's very pronounced in, in the United States. Now, there's a second track, a parallel track, that is more unique to the United States, although it's happening in a few other countries which is political polarization. So in the United States, as we all know, uh, Congress has gotten extraordinarily polarized. There was, a, there was a long, low period of polarization in the mid 20th century, many opportunities for bipartisanship. Um, but since the 1980s in particular, it's been a straight upward climb to levels of, of, of partisan polarization unseen since the Civil War. Now that's our political elites, uh, that's Congress, uh, but it's happening in the people too. This is national survey data. What do you think about all sorts of things? Uh, one of the things they ask about is the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and as you see, the top two lines show in blue, Democrats have a positive view of the Democratic Party and they always have Republicans, same about the Republican Party, although I wonder if that would still be true in the last few months. Um, but the cross-party ratings have plummeted in the 70s, people were slightly negative about the other party and people in the other party because there were all kinds of people in the other party. Um, but in the last few, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, it's gone way, way down. We now really, really dislike the people in the other party. And that brings us to trend number eight. As hostility has increased across the parties, um, it be our, many of our institutions are purifying. So the academy has always leaned left, at least for the last 100 years. But since the 90s, it has gone almost entirely left. So this is the academy overall, um, including all the professional schools. And uh, so in one study, it found that about the ratio is about 3 to 1, 60% liberal, 20% conservative. About 10 years ago, that was. So the academy overall, uh, when, the, when the greatest generation retired, in the 90s, replaced by the baby boomers, the academy overall has been drifting very strongly to the left. But many fields, um, especially in the social sciences and humanities, have gone much, much further. This is my own field, social psychology, a paper I published with some colleagues who are alarmed by this trend. And what we found when we put all the surveys together is that psychology, academic psychology, has always leaned to the left, but throughout the 20th century, the ratio was about two to one of, Republic, of Democrats to Republicans or liberals to conservatives, or maybe four to one, depending on the survey. All the way up to 1990, that ratio held. Uh, but since 1990, it has shot up to 14 to one. 14 to one. In fact, I only know one conservative social psychologist. I've asked people, you know, people who argue with me, they say I'm wrong. I say, okay, fine, find me a second one. Nobody can. And that brings us to trend number nine. When a social science or humanity field is 100% on the left, then social justice rises in importance. It's no longer just a personal value of two thirds of the field. It becomes the unifying value of the field. It is a sacred value. And by sacred, what I mean, uh, what Phil Tetlock means, is no trade-offs. Sacred means you, you can't weigh it against something else. It is a sacred <clears throat> value, and you will be very angry at anybody who challenges or threatens that sacred value. You can't even have open discussions about issues of race and gender. They're very, very constrained. They're very, very dangerous conversations to have if you don't hold the orthodox view on those topics. Because anything you say or any academic study that you try to publish or that you refer to could make some people uncomfortable, and we cannot allow that to happen. That would make them feel marginalized, and that is our most important value in the social sciences, is fighting marginalization. It is not finding truth. And so the two streams have begun to converge, especially in just the last few years. Uh, what I mean by that is this. 
when we have, just in recent years, the last five or 10 years, um, as the students coming into college have been raised without free range childhoods, and they come into an academy that is now fully embracing social justice as the primary mission, what happens? The answer, the rise of victimhood culture. There's an extraordinary essay by two, um, two um, sociologists, um, um, Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning. This is a short version of their, of their academic paper. Uh, this is a quote from their longer academic paper. They describe the sociological conditions that lead to the rise of victimhood culture when an, an institution is entirely on the left um, and it has, it has institutional structures to punish violations. There's a motive for people then to appeal to those institutional structures to punish those violations. So a culture of victimhood is marked by these three properties, they say. Uh, first, individuals and groups display a very high sensitivity to slight, and you, we see this with the concept of microaggressions. You can be prosecuted for a microaggression. Um, people have a tendency to handle conflicts through complaints to third parties. They don't try to settle it themselves. They want to bring someone else in on their side to punish. And third, they seek to cultivate an image of being victims who deserve assistance. So. Um, when I said it has to do with things today, if you have not yet heard about the Yale Halloween email, you will hear about it within 24 hours because it's in the New York Times today and it will be in all other papers by tomorrow. I won't take the time to give you an overview because you will, again, very soon find out. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, it was about, a, well, a, a, an email that the wife of the Master of Silliman College at Yale sent out. It looks like a very good academic discussion about whether, it's a, whether one should be very sensitive or, or careful about Halloween costumes. Uh, but the fact that she disagreed with the dominant position led to extremely angry responses, demands that the dean, her husband, or the master, uh, her husband, apologize for her email. Uh, and when he refused, uh, well, you can watch the, you'll watch the video, and it's really quite astonishing um, what happens. So. Um, just to make clear that this is the victimhood culture, uh, one, of the, one of the students involved wrote this, this essay uh, 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 describing why she and her fellow students are so upset. And she, uh, she analogized the situation to her relationship to her father. And sometimes, you know, there's a time for just hearing and acknowledging someone's pain. And then she says, um, Christakis hasn't checked in on any of us. He hasn't given us an indication that he's going to or wants to heal the community. If you know I'm in pain and you aren't doing anything to try to help me, then how can you be sorry? Christakis is the master of Silliman College. It is his job to take care of us, and he is failing. I went to Yale. I graduated in 1985. I cannot imagine a Yale student of my generation writing something like this. <laughs> and so this brings us to my, my conclusion. The victimhood culture is incompatible with individual initiative. As this spreads across our campuses, we can expect a decline in the graduates um, of these colleges in individual initiative. Um, because the victimhood culture encourages a group-based view of the world, it encourages acceptance of the victim label, and when people accept this as an identity, that makes them passive. Uh, third, victims become moral dependents. As I said, if somebody calls you a stupid idiot, I mean, I look at my kids now. If they're with kids, some kid calls another kid a stupid idiot, they don't call the kid a stupid idiot back. All eyes turn to the adult. What is the adult going to do about this? Someone has to take care of this, not me. Um, we get reduced freedom of speech. People are walking on eggshells. And what I'm finding is this is not a college problem only. It's high schools. The, the students come to college already in this mindset. It's our high schools and earlier that are, that are doing this. Um, and increased fear of going against the majority view. So to summarize, I've suggested that there is this general trend of rising peace and prosperity that capitalism breeds. It's very good for innovation. But it sets up people to be frailer, to be not as tough. Um, I'm suggesting that at least in the United States, there's been a second stream of political polarization and animosity, and that these two streams have intersected, particularly in the last two years. Uh, the most, uh, uh, all these terms, microaggressions, the campus disinvitations, um, these mostly start in the fall semester of 2013 for some reason, and they're going really intensely now. Uh, and so that is my... Um, uh, uh, suggestion of one route by which capitalism can end up suppressing individual initiative. Thank you. I took uh, Philip's title seriously as uh, how evolving social values suppress uh, individual initiative, and, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. 
I don't think there's much question that there are some social values that suppress uh, initiative. And I think John's talk was a perfect example of uh, one kind of social value that has been suppressing initiative in the very recent past. And I think that it is sometimes a bad thing to suppress individual initiative. That said, I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian uh, and suggest two things. One, there are other influences aside from social values uh, that we seem perfectly sanguine about that also suppress initiative and that suppress initiative more and that have been suppressing initiative for a half century. Uh, the one I have in mind uh, most especially is this enormous fear, fear of failure that you see in the private sector and in science that is pervasive in stifling uh, individual initiative. And uh, I, I'm going to suggest that the incentive structure that dominates both in the private sector and in the academy, alas, is a more plausible candidate for explaining this uh, lack of initiative than the kinds of evolving social values that, uh, that John talked to you about. The second point I want to make is that sometimes it's a good thing to uh, stifle individual initiative. There is a big difference between creativity and randomness, although you don't always know it by listening to people talk about creativity. Creativity is variation within constraint, and we need constraint. And the question is, where does that constraint come from? OK, so first, fear of failure. Uh, the dean of 20th century philosophy of science, Karl Popper, in trying to explain scientific progress, he had this model of what he called bold conjectures and refutation. Uh, the nice thing about scientific hypotheses is that they can be falsified. So the way to do good science is to make the boldest conjectures you can, formulate the boldest hypotheses you can, and then try to show that they're false. Or if not you, somebody else will be more than happy to show that your hypotheses are false. This is how science makes progress, bold conjectures and refutations. This is not the way modern science operates. I would say that in most scientific disciplines at the moment, there is simply nothing worse than being wrong which means that instead of bold conjectures, you get timid conjectures. My own view is that there is something worse than being wrong. Uh, there are a couple of things that are worse. One is being really boring, and the other is being completely trivial. And what I think characterizes much of science is a combination of the boring and the trivial, because the consequences of failure are enormous. If you fail, you don't get tenure. If you fail, you don't get a grant. If you fail, you don't get your results published. It is, sci it is career suicide to engage in bold conjectures, which will likely be false, uh, and then invite, uh, invite their reputation. Publication pressure pushes us towards safety. The result is CVs that are an arm's length long and of absolutely no, uh, uh, and no illuminating value to anyone. Uh, they're good for wallpaper, but not much else. Now, some people risk being wrong, and these are the people who move fields forward. And the thing is that the progress of science, <coughs> I wrote a paper that made this point, I almost got killed, the progress of science is really one damn mistake after another. Mistakes are what lead to progress. The economic structure of science pushes people to fear mistakes. It's not a matter of being socially or politically correct. It's a matter of uh, career economic survival. Uh, in the private sector, something similar. I read in the, in the high tech sector that fail, but fail fast. So failure is OK as long as you don't drag it out. Now, this may seem like not such a bad thing, but it is a bad thing because sometimes really good ideas take some time to ripen. And if your criterion is fast evaluation, lots of really good ideas will never get developed. So it may seem like fail fast is better than don't fail at all, but I'm not sure it's really the solution to the problem. Short-termism is the huge enemy of innovation. Uh, 
Failures hurt share prices, failures hurt bonuses, failures cost jobs. This, it seems to me, is the 8,000 pound gorilla. Uh, and uh, not wanting to hurt other people's feelings is sort of like the ingrown toenail on the 800 pound gorilla. Bureaucracy also doesn't help. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, written by a social psychologist named Elliot Aronson and Carol Tavers called Mistakes Were Made, parentheses, but not by me. <laughs> this, of course, is the watchword of every pol politician in the last 30 years. Um, so by all means, we should worry about uh, creative, innovative impulses being stifled by social norms. But let's worry about fixing that problem after we fix the stifling of innovation uh, by an incentive system that absolutely pervades all of our social institutions. So that's my first point. My second point is about creativity and randomness. A philosopher named Daniel Dennett made a point many years ago in, a, in, a, in an article. He said it takes two to create anything. Now what he meant by that is not necessarily that it takes two people, uh, but that it takes two people living inside the head of one person. You need the part of you that generates <coughs> ideas and the part of you that selects. So it's a kind of Darwinian model of creativity and advancement where you've got random variation or some kind of variation and then selection. So the question he asked is which of these two is the creative process? Now it might seem that the creativity is in generation. Generate the ideas, that's creative. The selecting is entirely analytic. The point he makes is that the right answer to the question which is the creative part is it depends. Sometimes it takes, it is indeed in generating the ideas that creativity lies. If you're living in the midst of a culture that is essentially stultified intellectually, somebody needs to generate new ideas. But sometimes, like say today, when ideas are being generated completely randomly, without any thought, the real creativity, it seems to me, lies in the selection and not in the generativity. We do not at the moment have a generativity problem in modern uh, digital society. We have a selectivity problem. Uh, in modern culture in which people speak first and think second, there's a lot to be said in favor of anything that reverses the process a little bit by getting people to think before they speak. And in that, if that were to happen, we would have the creativity residing in the selection rather than in the generation. So it, real innovation and real creativity is variation within constraints. Sometimes there are too many constraints, but sometimes there are too few. And I think modernity, that is to say the moment we're living in now, is a time when there are too few constraints, not too many. Uh, this brings me to my, uh, my final point. I wrote a book about the problem of having too much choice. W uh, mostly the book was focused on uh, the problems it poses for people who are making consumption decisions, but it could also apply to people making decisions about what to invest in, what ideas to pursue, what papers to write, what topics to study. Um, it would seem that having unlimited choice would be a boon to innovation. You have a blank canvas. Anything is possible. But research suggests that it's not such a boon to innovation. When people are presented with the equivalent of a blank canvas, instead of being freed up to create, what ends up happening at least some of the time is that they're paralyzed into complete inaction. And so I actually did have a slide. But the right hand arrow. Ah, yes. there we go. So this is a cartoon from The New Yorker. You can be anything you want to be, no limits. Now, when I first saw this cartoon, I thought we were supposed to laugh at how myopic the parent fish is, imagining that in this fishbowl, you could say to your offspring, you can be anything you want to be, no limits. But then I thought about it a little bit, and I came to the conclusion, whatever the cartoonist might have intended, that we need fishbowls. In the absence of fishbowls, you don't have creativity, you have chaos. In the absence of fishbowls, you don't have freedom, you have paralysis and probably terror. 
We need fish bowls. And the thing that none of us knows the answer to is what needs to be in the fish bowl so that people can engage in creative activity without being paralyzed and without being stultified. And here I just want to um, echo a point uh, that Peter Thiel made at lunch. I don't think there's a general answer to that question. I think the answer to the question, what needs to be in the fishbowl, is it depends. And I don't mean only it depends on the industry and the particular problem you're trying to develop a solution to. It also depends on where and when in history one lives. Sometimes the fishbowl needs to be pared down. Sometimes the fishbowl needs to be enriched. Uh, different social contexts and different cultural contexts require different fishbowls. So that answering the question, what does the fishbowl need, it really requires knowing history more than it requires knowing any uh, of the other social sciences. And I'll make one last point about why we need fishbowls. I just recently finished a book written by George Akerlof and uh, Robert Schiller called Fishing for Fools. It's a short book that argues, I think, um, uh, make, argues for a very deep point, which is the equilibrium state of, of markets is the exploitation of consumers largely because of asymmetric information. This is the default state. The default state is that your car dealer will take advantage of you, your investment advisor will take advantage of you, your druggist will take advantage of you. Uh, it's in the absence of government regulation, we are basically going to get beat up at every opportunity. And if you want to be a nice um, uh, uh, value in, uh, investor or start a nice value-based company, you're simply going to be driven out of business by other competitors who are perfectly happy to exploit every edge uh, that uh, uh, ignorant consumers make available. And what that suggests to me is that in an environment in which people feel absolutely no ethical constraints when it comes to pursuing profit in marketplaces, the fishbowl needs to be pretty constrained indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Barry, Jonathan. Well, I'll pick right up on that. Um, I, uh, I write about the effects of legal structures on human behavior. Um, the role of law is actually to set boundaries, to have a fishbowl, uh, within which people are free to, um, to pursue their, their dreams, to follow their star and such. Where those boundaries are depends on the values of our time. A uh, hundred years ago, a Model T was a perfectly safe car. We wouldn't think it was a safe car now. We've had a number of practices that were widely accepted in our society by law and otherwise that would be wholly unacceptable, uh, wholly unacceptable today. So uh, legal structures evolve in accord with social values, part of, part of our discussion today. Uh, and so, one shouldn't argue, as the far right sort of does, is we shouldn't have boundaries, we shouldn't have regulation. But how those boundaries work uh, should be evaluated by whether they enhance the freedom of people in our society consistent with our social values. And what I'm going to say today is I think that what's happened is that uh, law is no longer a framework for freedom in accord with good values. It has supplanted freedom. It is actually suppressing the best values of our culture in the name of protecting certain values, a la the Yale Halloween d dispute. And there's a historical context to this, which, uh, which I feel, starting with this audience, we must address in a public narrative in our society because it's not sustainable. It started in the 1960s. We woke up to bad values uh, and abuses of authority, racism, gender discri discrimination, pollution, lies about the Vietnam War, locking up disabled children in places like Mil uh, Willowbrook. And we decided we were not going to have these abuses of authority anymore. Everybody got to work on it. You remember, many of us, that, that evulsive decade. Uh, the causes were all just. Uh, we came up with a new philosophy of law where, among other things, we would have uh, as prescriptive as possible rules that would be detailed, that would tell people how to do things correctly so we wouldn't have abuses of discretion. And where we couldn't have rules, we would have rights. 
and rights were no longer protections against uh, abusive state authority. They were rights against anyone you didn't like. If there was an accident, you could sue even if the person acted reasonably. If your child, if you felt that uh, um, someone was treated you unfairly in the workplace, you, you could sue them. If the job recommendation that you didn't like, you could sue them. And so all of a sudden, the land of the First Amendment, and this is the rule in America, no one gives a job reference. This has evolved over the course of the last 50 years till now we have a, uh, a legal culture and increasingly a corporate culture, which I think reflects part of what Barry said, which is a culture that it tries to avoid human agency entirely. We look to law, we look to system, we avoid mistakes. Uh, 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 we're happy to have trial and error as long as there's no error. <laughs> so, so, so the system has come up, so it, and the problem with it is it doesn't work. So just briefly, the, the growth of rules now gives us this, this odd government where in the name of predictability, we have things like the 950-page Volcker rule. So it's entirely incoherent even to the practitioners of it, whereas by contrast, the Constitution, uh, an organic document, is more or less 10 pages long. Uh, we have, uh, Mayor Bloomberg found that if you wanted to start a business, uh, start a restaurant in New York, you had to get permits from 11 different agencies. Imagine trying to do that. The World Bank has ranked, now ranked the U.S. 47th in the world in ease of starting a business. You go into any, uh, any social activity, it is uh, weighed down by so many rules that actually people, there are studies of this, people cannot comply with them. Large companies with huge legal staffs cannot comply with all the rules. So we have universal non-compliance with what we call the rule of law because, because there's so much of it. Um, we, uh, Common Good is a, a not-for-profit that I chair. We released a, a study in September uh, looking at the cost of infrastructure uh, uh, bureaucracy, which has evolved uh, over the last 45 years, which turns out that the red tape around approving infrastructure, not funding it, more than doubles the cost of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the official regulations say that environmental impact statements should be, even the most, in the most complex projects, no more than 300 pages. I tell the story of trying to raise the roadway of the Bayonne Bridge, a project with no environmental impact, same foundation, same right of way, where the environmental impact statement was 20,000 pages. Mm -hmm. And it's litigation, it's still in litigation over what? The inadequacy of the review. Uh, we also found that lengthy environmental review dramatically harms the environment because it prolongs bottlenecks that in a, in a decrepit infrastructure system so that, for example, the archaic power grid wastes the equivalent of 200 coal-burning power plants worth of electricity because there's, no, and it, because there's no certainty in even getting the approval, and all projects have some environmental impact. There's no project doesn't. The question is whether the benefits of it exceed, you know, are, are greater than the impact, but the, the process doesn't allow that. So we have, as we've, as we've evolved, we have this, this culture where human choice and natural instinct and spontaneity are replaced by self-consciousness and defensiveness. Emergency room doctors spend a third of their time on paperwork, and they order an estimated $100 billion worth of unnecessary tests just in case they get sued, for example. Um, we have, this operates on many levels. The, the, the idea of human agency, deciding for yourself what's appropriate, is so far out of the conception of a modern um, institutional culture that Congress no longer understands that it's actually responsible for all the old law. So it argues in any given um, term over maybe a dozen dozen uh, legal issues, you know, whether to fund Planned Parenthood or how to fund, how to, how to, uh, uh, whether to pass, or how to 
fund, you know, fixing up the highways and such. Underneath Congress are 10,000 legislatively authorized programs. Not one of them is not broken. They're broken because no one has made the choices to adapt them, not because we don't need the Food and Drug Administration, but because it shouldn't take a decade to approve a good drug. If it's safe, it, it's uh, special ed is, was a perfectly good program that came out of the scandals of the 1960s, but Congress, when they enacted special ed, didn't intend it to consume 25 to 30 percent of the total K-12 to budget. Mm -hmm. We're talking about innovation. There's almost no money in America's schools for gifted programs. I don't even think it rises to 1 percent. Is that the right balance? 25 percent for special ed, less than 1 percent for gifted programs? No one's even asking the question. So we've created this culture of fear and defensiveness and compliance with this huge amount of energy going toward avoiding being in trouble with someone and where no one's in charge. It's not Orwell, it's not Big Brother, it's Huxley. It's this, it's this system where everyone's on SOMA and they're on autopilot and everyone's saying, well, it must be, must be your responsibility or it must be your responsibility. Whatever you do, don't make a mistake. Don't take a risk. For God's sake, don't say what you really think about the First Amendment at Yale. So we have a social, we have social values in this country uh, that have evolved not from nowhere because of abuses. And they've somehow mutated into a place where instead of arguing about good values, we've accepted a culture of no values. Where people don't actually avoid their own values, they game the system for themselves. And there's no one actually saying, well, what's right? And what about the bigger principles? What about freedom of speech? What about trial and error? What about all the conditions for innovation? that are all being taken away in this kind of scaredy cat uh, culture. And it's an important, it's a really bad damper on human innovation. The people in the Silicon Valley are lucky because they were dealing in an unregulated environment in an entirely new industry. Heaven help you if you're providing basic social services or manufacturing or doing any of the things that, that we're used to, or you know, providing health care. So our values, inc including the values of not changing old law, I mean, American democracy is run by dead people. It's run by the people who wrote all those laws who are long gone. They prescribe exactly how we spend the money, exactly how sp people spend the day in industries around America. And they're nowhere to be seen. So we're going to somehow have to accept the idea of human agency, starting with agency at the top, take responsibility for changing values to actually creating a fishbowl, to go to Barry's point, that's actually deliberate, but in pursuit first of the main value, which is a free society in which people are free, consistent with our modern values, to innovate, to take risks, to say what they think to other people, to tolerate conflict and competition among ideas without legal consequence. That's what a free society is supposed to be. And we're on a path, I wish I had a chart, but it'd be hard to quantify, a path downward against that. And then it's going to take something of a revolution, I fear, as Peter suggested today, to get it back. Thank you. I do not have a uh, slide, and, and I'm impressed with what my three fellow panelists have said, and I agree with all of it. My, I, my, I'm old enough, uh, I'm 80, 80 years old, so um, I can remember an America society that wasn't scared to death. Uh, what I am impressed about American Society Day is how 
cringing and cowardly it is. And the, uh, <coughs> and I can actually see that happen. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I grew up in San Francisco during World War II, 19, so I'm there, 1941, 1945. I see the uh, carriers in the bay. My uh, family were, my father was in New Guinea and other guys are passing in, passing through California, I mean passing through San Francisco to the, to the war in the Pacific. And they're not scared. I mean, they're, <laughs> it's also a volunteer army. It's unlike the army we have today, which is uh, a mercenary army and trying and our deluded uh, generals in, in, in Washington are trying to turn, turn our army into machinery. They think the whole thing can be done with drones. They think that they can uh, <laughs> hide themselves or hide um, behind um, some magnificent technology. <laughs> And that, of course, is idiotic. And, and you can see how useless it is uh, in Syria and how useless it was in Vietnam. Uh, again, I'm old enough to, to say that, I, that America has been at war for my whole life. The, uh, as soon as we, we got to the end of the uh, Cold War. I mean, we got to the end of World War II, and then we develop the Cold War with the Russians, which is based on flat-out paranoid fantasy. I mean, one of the things that's consistent throughout all of this, of course, is Richard Hofstadter's essay published in Harper's Magazine in 1964 about the paranoid style of American politics. <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know, I can remember as a, not quite as a school child, but I can remember in the 50s where school children are being forced to uh, uh, hide under desks. Very early lesson in, in becoming a victim. All the messages uh, from the Cold War are the United States is the pure well of innocence and grace by definition. All Americans are virtuous, all Americans are right, all Americans are unpolluted by sin, and so forth. And the, uh, but we're surrounded by enemies on all horizons, foreigners, disease, war, communism, strange languages, French intellectuals. I mean, the entire, the, 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 the America is, is the innocent uh, island, the land of, you know, home of the brave, and so on. Now, <clears throat> the truth of the matter, of course, is that America has always been terrified of free speech. Tocqueville makes a long point about that in, in, in Democracy in America. He's, he's, truly surprised to come to democracy, which and he's heard about all of this energy and, and uh, defiance of authority and so forth. And, and here's, here's a society that, that is so devoted to money that it is constantly bowing and scra it, It's more of a court society than, than uh, Tocqueville had known in France. Because in France, in a court society, you only have to bow to the king. But in America, you have to bow to any embodiment of money. So it can be a county clerk, it can be a politician, it can be a CEO, it can, who the hell knows? But you're forever on bended knee. And <clears throat> that is certainly true now. I mean, that's the society we've been living in pretty much. Uh, I'm, I've seen that get worse over 
over uh, time. I mean, during the course of my lifetime. The, uh, the notion that we are all, that no, that everybody is entitled. That notion comes up in the, uh, I guess, begins to arise out of the 60s and the, um, comes into um, force in the 70s and then the 80s. I mean, that is what Reagan's elected on. America is a country where somebody can always get rich. Of course, that's not quite true. It's the, uh, the someones who happen to be well connected and, and, and so on. But I mean, the notion of, of entitlement, of, of uh, uh, rights to uh, certain kinds of social justice, it is, that's not in the Constitution. That's, uh, that's really not part of the deal. Uh, one was, we get into the notion that we can buy the future instead of earn it. And the, uh, or instead of make it. And I, I am just, um, I mean, look at look, <laughs> the, we have this, the Central Intelligence Agency. I'm, I'm writing a, at the moment, I'm writing the next piece about, the, the next issue of Harper's Magazine is about uh, spies and about the, <laughs> the uh, national security state that we managed to create for ourselves. <clears throat> but we've been working on that for a long time. And it, that comes out of the Espionage Act of 1917, and it is nurtured by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, and then comes out of the psychopathology of the Cold War. But, the, uh, <clears throat> but subsequent to 9-11, uh, we have now spent close to a trillion dollars, and we now have uh, 450,000 inquisitors, petty and grand, in something like, by now, probably 70 different federal intelligence agencies of, of various, uh, in various modes. <laughs> and, what we have done is made, made a bureaucracy so big and it's incoherent. People in the intelligence community are presented with reports, digital, come out of at 20,000 pages a day. <laughs> Who can possibly make sense out of that? No, they, don't, they do not know how to connect the dots. They can't. <laughs> It doesn't work. I mean, the uh, but we built this great sort of uh, umbrella of of protective fantasy, and I, I don't know. I can go on. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, but 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 the uh, I, I all the other points. I mean, it's to be presented. Imagine also the 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 dropping of of, of standards of of not. Uh, giving an honest opinion of something. I mean, praising kids' paintings in, in nursery school as if they were works of genius. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, I, I went, to, I was at Yale. I was uh, uh, invited to teach a class, and I graduated in the 50s, but I was invited to teach a class in the late 80s on writing. Uh, creative nonfiction writing, and the <laughs> I had seminar at twelve places. The um, I had about forty applications. I read, and they were all asked to write a paragraph of why did you want? Why do you want to take this class? And so I read the uh, I read the paragraph before I looked at the name <laughs> and picked the what I thought were the 12 best paragraphs, turned over the uh, applications, all girls. And the uh, chairman of the department said, no, you have to have six boys, six girls, forget it. <laughs> and he said, and beside that, these are all important students and they're our brightest students in the junior and senior class, and none of them get below a B plus. <clears throat> I said, well, <laughs> 
I'm not coming back. I'm not on the tenure track. I don't want to be a professor at Yale. If I teach this course and a kid gets a D, he's going to get a D. And I don't care. <clears throat> and that's what happened. But of course, I, know I wasn't on tenure, and I not teaching at Yale. <laughs> but, the, uh, but that sort of thing is, is uh, you know, I mean, the culture that we produce, the, to be given a blank page is, 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 a blank canvas is really, really hard. It's, it's I, you know, to write to a form, I mean, to, to, to try to write a, to a verse in, in, a, in a formal verse, write, try to write a sonnet, try to write uh, music in some kind of formal sonata structure of some kind. That, that, that is likely to produce a more uh, enlightening result than, than the <laughs> Open carry on 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 the canvas with the with the crayons. <laughs> uh, wait a minute, I have one more point on that, but I forgot it. So you, you, you'll you'll answer it when I ask when yeah, I answer yeah, the question. Okay, Thank okay, you. Okay. So um, <laughs> so we have a few few minutes, uh, not many, but um, I think we started late. But the um, there's a, um, it's as if we're all kind of serfs in a larger force. You know, there's no ownership, it seems to me, of, of our own choices to start. And then, you know, our community, you know, can we stretch it outward. How do one, how does, uh, how do we claw this back? I mean, how do we get back to a narrative where we accept differences in view and conflict and, uh, uh, and, and failure? Imagine, um, you know, and, and, and uh, there was this book by Albert Hirschman, uh, uh, Jonathan reminds me, called Exit Voice and Loyalty, um, you know, where, you know, where the, the great mechanisms of, of, of interaction, both within organizations and within cultures are, well, you, you find affinity groups, you like them, you're loyal to them to a certain extent until you, they lose their loyalty, or you really don't like them and you exit, you know, and, and, or in, and there's a voicing part in the middle. But we don't have the voicing or the exiting. We just assume that everything's supposed to be kind of somehow fit together in some sort of perfect alignment. So there's never a disappointed Yale student or whatever. I mean, what do you do? Well, that's okay. the self-selective system of the internet. I mean, you just go to look at your reflection in the mirror somewhere, right? I mean, you don't have to talk to anybody with a different idea or opinion, you don't have to read it. You, you make your own little universe and, and they, they are receding from one another literally at the speed of light. It dissolves the society. I was just going to say that I, I think this is a generational problem, not, a, uh, not something to be fixed like flipping a switch. And I think John's point about the way in which we're raising children is key. Unless um, Unless we create more resilient kids, then uh, reintroducing the world you're talking about will just shatter glass. You can't do that for people who aren't who are unprepared, who don't who are, people who think that any criticism is a criticism of the self and a violation. You can't start engaging in the rough and tumble that you were probably used to when you were in college. So we have to build back up the resilience of students, probably starting when they're three or four years old, not giving every kid an award for participating, acknowledging that some kids are better painters than others. Um, and then we'll have people entering college in a decade who can take it. Now, that won't be enough by itself. But if we just introduced right. it, changed the rules starting tomorrow, you could just, you right. know, it would create massive destruction of uh, People's personalities. I got. I never got a hit in Little League, and they would publish the batting averages in the local newspaper. So I suffered a lifetime, a boyhood of humiliation, and as a result, you never got a hit. I'm completely no. willing to accept failure. You know. Yeah, we have a big trophy for you now. <laughs> well, I guess I, I would add that uh, 
after, after hearing all the talks here, including my own, I'm really depressed. And um, to have a, a panel of four grumpy old men up here, and I'll, I'll count myself now as a grumpy old man based on what I said, um, I think that, that the, the, an older generation, and we have a couple of generations here, um, is very, very important as a witness, as a reminder of, of how, you know, how things have changed, as, as Mr. Lappin uh, uh, showed us. Um, but we may not be so great at coming up with solutions. We can be helpful in diagnosing some of the causes and in saying, whoa, this is, this is, it's not just that it's against our values, this is actually bad for the young people themselves. So that's the first point. I think we can focus on sort of diagnosis rather than on how to fix things. Um, the second point is that I have found, since publishing that article in The Atlantic, where I expected, Greg Lukianoff and I, we expected a lot of pushback. We expect there to be a lot of controversy. And what's happened is everybody agrees, except for there were two professors uh, in the humanities under 35 who wrote things that were opposed, but that's it, just two. Wow. And my point is that it's basically the emperor's new clothes. That is, most people agree with it, but they haven't had a language to stand up to right. it. And when you write about, you know, you write about and you tell us these stories that make our blood boil, everyone agrees with you, right? I mean, right. we all right. recognize that there are right. problems. So I think we need a, we can be helpful, or all of us can be helpful in pointing to problems and getting people from multiple generations right. involved in thinking of solutions. Right, but it's a new narrative where different disciplines have to come together saying we've got a serious problem here and it has to do yeah. with the way humans actually accomplish things and make choices and deal with each other. I mean, it's very fundamental. You know, in yeah. our, it's That's very right. fundamental and I, yeah. in our culture. And I think it cannot happen at the universities. It's yeah. going to have um, to happen somewhere well, else. Let's have some questions here. Well, uh, well, let me just make one quick comment on that because that is the reason that I started the Lapham's Quarterly because what goes in the fishbowl is history. And, and the... Uh, so that, this is a quarterly that it, it's 224 pages and it's writing by people like Aristophanes and Shakespeare and Virginia Woolf and so on on a topic that's current in the news. And the ki I thought when I started it, I, I thought it was a lot of grumpy old men like myself would be subscribers, but it's not true. What happens is there are a lot of, of kids in their 20s who are History is an enormous resource. Goethe said, he who cannot draw in 3,000 years is living hand to mouth. And these poor kids have been living hand to mouth. I mean, what, what's in the winter, what comes and goes in the, in the, in the, in the internet is, is uh, it's like shreds in a wind tunnel. And they have no idea wh where, they, where they come from what the history of this country is. They have no idea about American history. They don't, Yale doesn't teach that anymore. Uh, <coughs> they teach, you know, feminist pewter. They don't teach the Constitution. <coughs> and, the, and so okay, there is you. something that can be done. I think this uh, panel's been extraordinarily uh, illuminating, and I <coughs> am gonna have to agree, I'm afraid, John. But John and Barry, I agree with particularly. Uh, I've been teaching more than 40 years. Uh, most of that time was at Williams, an elite liberal arts college, and last 10 years or so here at Columbia. And there's been a significant change, but I, I want to introduce the issue of economics uh, and higher education into this equation, yeah. uh, because I think it's crucial. Uh, the helicopter parents, to be sure, but um, in large measure, what I found uh, with students is that the aversion to risk has been pounded into them since pre-K. Uh, because at every, at every level, I mean, we know what getting into pre-kindergarten is here in New York City. And like from, at every level, when my, my son was here, when his daughter was two, and uh, my daughter-in-law called me up all excited that uh, Selma got an interview at Purple Circle. She was 14, were being interviewed for two places. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find, part of it's related to the cost of education. Part of it's related to parental, I don't believe in trickle-down economics. I do believe in trickle-down anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, there's trickle-down anxiety yeah. from the parents to the children. And these kids, have their creativity pounded out of them from pre-K because they know, and the tragedy is they're not wrong, that one B minus, K 
can be the difference between getting into Williams or Yale or Columbia, given changing admissions policies and the like. And the kids, they've told me repeatedly, they've learned the downside of risk. Right. Uh, so we as, we as, you know, and, as college educators have a, have a part to play in all of this. Yeah. Uh, and it's very complicated yeah. because of the changing demographics yeah. well, I think of the way you presented higher education it. Well, I think and the way, of admissions. I think the way that you've presented it actually suggests, and I would agree with this, that college educators actually don't have that much to do with it. I think the revolution has to start with charter schools in, beginning with pre-K. Charter schools and Catholic schools could implement anti-coddling policies. It's fine to have an anti-bullying policy, but it should always be paired with an anti-coddling policy. Yeah, but, but, but the selectivity but, issue, I, you know, the, Philip Cook and uh, Robert Frank wrote a book some years ago called the winner take all society. And I think you're quite right that many parents, especially parents of upper middle class right. types, think that either their kid gets into Yale or they're homeless. Right. There, there's no sort of graceful degradation from the top through the middle. Uh, there, are, there are ways, there are ways to, to deal with this, but I think John's right. If you, if you implement them at the college level, it's already it's too, too late. late. But a simple lottery system uh, at every level where you simply have to be good enough and lucky. I know we heard at lunch today that luck is the word that lazy people use, but luck also characterizes most life outcomes of most people. If you're good enough and lucky, you get in, and if you're good enough and unlucky, you don't. And you don't have to sacrifice what you're interested in. You don't have to sacrifice creativity. You don't have to risk making, uh, uh, refuse to risk being wrong, because all you have to do is be good enough. That, in an instant, would, tr would I think, alleviate the kind of pressure that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take more time. I, I don't disagree, but um, I, I want to, I mean, about what you're saying about the elementary night. But I think one of yeah. the drivers of that trickle down are the policies let at the college level because that that's what they're aiming yep. for. No, no, you're right. Yeah, that's okay, so more questions. Yes, go ahead. I feel a little like Dr. Pangloss. Um, Good. First of all, there was a recent survey at Yale. I went to Yale also, and 65 percent of the kids say they want to be entrepreneurs. This is either naivete, but it's certainly not uh, risk averse. They don't want to go to the big law firms anymore. They want to go to the big banks. And it also occurs to me, all this coddling on campus, I, I think it's true. My wife's on the board of Vassar. They're having terrible problems. Mm -hmm. But um, when you talk to the kids, a lot of them dismiss this as sort of the chattering classes getting carried away, like the Halloween story. And also, isn't there a correcting mechanism? It's called getting a job. And when they get out, they have to get one. And again, I have a lot of anecdotal evidence. It is not a coddling process. It's a really, they learn very quickly, three to six months, what it's like up there. So I think there's less than meets the eye here to worry about. Well, we'll see what happens when they get jobs. If I could buy stock in an employment law firm, I will do that because I'm guessing we're going to see a wave of employment lawsuits. Right, right. And, 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 I, and I wouldn't, I mean, going to John's point, you know, a lot of what we're saying will push on open doors. There's an emperor's no clothes aspect yeah. to it. But the people who have the narrative, and I would, I would include the political narrative too, if it's a different narrative, but you know, crazy right wingers, or for that matter, crazy left wingers, uh, are, are dominate the public discussion. And they have affected the way kids are raised. And they've affected the way playgrounds don't have seesaws, jungle gyms. You know, it's affected life in kids. There's a study, the, the, the free range of children has declined 95% over the last 40, uh, 40 years. So, I mean, it's just, the kids don't take responsibility for themselves. There are lots of actual real problems to go along with, you know, the, some of the corrective. Charlie Cobb. Um, thank you, Philip. First of all, this has been a terrible panel because as a result of you, I've lost control of my reading list now with all the wonderful suggestions you've made, which I will follow up on. Fortunately, I've read um, all of Philip's books, um, every word. And I want to play devil's advocate with Professor Haidt. Um, because here's what I think the problem is. You all have been absolutely superb in the diagnosis. And as Philip, Philip knows, I ran a think tank for 15 years. He was on my board. He was one of my bosses. And one of the things I had to do was to tra transfer intangible ideas into tangible results. 
And so I hope that one thing, Ned, this is for you, that can come out of this conference and perhaps the Smith Richardson Foundation and other funders, I think it's now time to take this wonderful diagnosis. I'm not going to agree with you. I'm not going to let you off the hook, Professor Hay. To figure out what are the action steps now, and literally to take a few pages from Vladimir Lenin and figure out, OK, who are the people in the media we have to go after? Who are the people in academia? academia, academia? Who are the political leaders? And literally <coughs> translate the intangible diagnosis that you've made into tangible results. Reagan did it. Bill mm -hmm. Bennett, by the way, took a similar approach when he was education secretary. It's not easy. It's fun. But it works. But it will take some time. And I hope there are people who have been here and heard this discussion, this wonderful panel, who will now flourish and be innovative in taking the next steps and turning all of this into very tangible action to improve the country and our children. So Great. thanks for the Thank you. One more question, and then we'll, then we'll drink. Uh, David? First of all, let me echo everybody else. I think this is the best panel of the day. Absolutely fantastic. And I agree with every one of you. And I agree with, I think everybody in this room agrees with every one of you. I'll pay you your $20 right after this. <laughs> and, and it's a real issue. But now, hold on one second, and let me play a slight devil's advocate. Okay, now certainly as an entrepreneur, I don't fear failure, and I, and I believe in risk, and I'm raising my kids that way. But the, the school, and, and I, I don't think I'm a grumpy old man, I'm actually older than, than, than John, but um, when, when I was at Yale, there, were, there is stuff that has happened in the intervening years, so this is a more aware society. There is, there is no question that, that some things relative to racial intolerance and, and sexual you know, acceptance of, of different kinds of things is better now than it was. I think there's no question. But, and, and part of the problem is we've gone too far. The, the Yale Halloween thing is the perfect example of getting a little too crazy, right? Right? No. But there has to, but is there not, not has to be, is there not some appropriate something that is not all the way here that says you can call anybody you want a faggot and you can discriminate against you know <clears throat> people of, of color and different things, while at the same time not being overly PC and being coddling? Yes, it's a there's a very simple um, uh, way to reach that balance. It is before students enter any community, be it high school or college, we train them especially in what's called the principle of charity. And that is, whenever someone says something, you apply the most charitable reading possible, not the least. For their summer reading, we don't give them reading that tries to sensitize them and make them angry about injustice. We give them Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And we say, diversity is really, really hard. And if you're quick to anger and, um, uh, and likely to condemn, then you should not be here because diversity is so hard. We can't do this with you. So we need to just simply change the way we think about diversity and recognize the benefits of diversity are real, but we are not reaping those benefits. We're actually reaping all the worst parts right. of diversity because oh, diversity is divisive. But, Right. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think that the, the, the theoretical insight that's necessary is an appreciation that there are few unmitigated goods. Um, so the, the kinds of social changes you're talking about are absolutely good. And it leads to the view that, there's, that the function is kind of linear. The more tolerant you are, the mm. more sensitive you are, the better. You, can, you can't possibly have too much of it. So once you identify that indeed you can have too much, as Aristotle knew, you need to find the mean, yeah. then all of a sudden people will become, one hopes, aware that um, uh, uh, you need to modulate your concern for the welfare and, sen and, uh, and feelings of other people with uh, uh, commitment to speaking your mind. Um, as you, when you feel that that's necessary. But I think up until now, people thought it was free. So you can always err on the side of generosity, kindness, and suppressing your opinions, because they, they have, that has no cost. We now know it has a substantial cost, and it may lead to a change in, uh, in the norms in academic institutions, though it's gonna take cur courageous administrators and faculty members to sort of push their students to insult one another once in a while. But, but, but I, I think that's it, that's it, that's it. That's a, that's a great way to end. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.